a new breakthrough just shook the foundations of high-energy physics. Scientists have now managed to generate pulses with a staggering one petawatt of power as one million nuclear power plants all firing at full blast, compressed into a pulse just one quadrillionth of a second long, and packed into that moment, a current of 100 kiloamperes. That's not just a lab trick. This is a step toward mega-ampere beams, and if we get there, the next chapter sounds like science fiction, pulling particles out of empty space. Yes, literally pulling matter from nothing. This isn't magic. In quantum electrodynamics, it's known as the Schwinger effect. When a powerful enough field can spark a particle and an antiparticle from the vacuum, the field's energy becomes mass. Matter is born, not from nothing, but from the violent ripples in quantum fields. And for the first time, we're inching close to seeing this in a lab. That's not just new tech. It's a chance to test the very fabric of quantum field theory and maybe glimpse the forces that shape the early universe or ripple today near black holes. Because here's the thing, these extreme experiments don't just give us data, they question reality itself. At present, we treat space-time as the stage for everything, like the paper on which reality is drawn. But what if that's not true? What if space and time aren't the foundation, but just a side effect of something deeper? Physicist Nima Arkani Hamed proposed three brutal thought experiments to test just how solid our everyday idea of space and time really is. If you think you understand space-time, brace yourself, because we're about to push it until it breaks. First experiment, what happens when we zoom into reality? Physicists use particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider to do just that. Smash particles together at near light speed, rip open reality, see what's hiding inside. The higher the energy, the smaller the wavelength. That means better resolution. You want to peek into the heart of a proton? That's about 10 to the minus 15th power meters. You'll need particles with even shorter wavelengths, even higher energies. Simple, but push it too far and something wild happens. Cram too much energy into too tiny a space, boom. You create a black hole, a microscopic one, yes, but still a black hole. And here's the problem, it swallows everything. Nothing escapes, not even the information from your experiment. The detectors, useless, you see nothing. This means there's a limit, a hard wall, on how small we can probe. Go past it and the universe shuts you out. That limit is called the Planck length. Below that, space-time stops making sense. It's not just that we can't see further. It's that maybe mm, there's nothing to see. Now what if we still tried to measure something at that scale? Second experiment. Quantum uncertainty slaps us in the face. At the quantum level, nothing is ever certain. You can't measure an exact position or energy without fuzz. That's uncertainty, and we live with it. But here's the trick. Use a bigger, denser instrument. Pack it with particles, and you can reduce that uncertainty. Stabilize it. Solidify your measurement. So what if we want the perfect measurement? Zero uncertainty, absolute truth. We build the ultimate measuring device, super massive, super dense, and we get a black hole, again. As a result, we will not be able to measure anything because the device now only takes everything we bring to it. It turns out that it is impossible to determine the physical properties of objects in space-time definitively, uncompromisingly, and accurately. This means that there may be another, even deeper level of reality in which flawless accuracy and, in this sense, truth are possible. All right, here's the final blow to our concept of reality. What happens if we try to cram as much information as possible into one chunk of space-time? Start with something simple, a room. Fill it with books. One book holds about half a megabyte. You can pack maybe 32 gigabytes into 100 cubic meters. Not bad. Swap those books out for hard drives, say one terabyte SSDs. You're now fitting in hundreds of millions of gigabytes. Cool. But let's go insane. Let's assume we have a storage medium as dense as the matter inside a neutron star, the densest thing in the known universe short of a black hole. Trillions upon trillions of gigabytes in one room. Now, add one more byte, boom. Your room collapses into a black hole. No more data, no more room. Just gravity, chewing it all into singularity soup. 
and here's where physics spits in your face again, you'd think the amount of information a black hole can hold depends on its volume, right? Wrong. Thanks to Stephen Hawking and Jacob Bekenstein, we now know that the maximum information capacity of a black hole depends on its surface area, the event horizon, not the interior. This is horrifying for our intuition. Volume grows with the cube, area only with the square. It turns out that the information capacity of space is much less than it should be if information filled the volume uniformly. This strange hypothesis leads to the idea of the holographic principle, to the idea that our three-dimensional reality may be a projection of information existing on a two-dimensional surface of a nature unknown to us. Unknown for now. In other words, our three-dimensional space-time may be nothing more than a hologram, an illusion generated by some more fundamental two-dimensional reality. But these are all thought experiments that we could test if we came close to creating ultra-extreme physical states, as we are already doing with petawatt laser pulses. But what could we discover where even space-time ends and something else begins? In three thought experiments, we approached fundamental limits. And, as it turns out, for space-time, it occurs at about 10 to the power of minus 33 centimeters and about 10 to the power of minus 43 seconds. For comparison, the size of a normal atom is about 10 to the power of minus 8, and the distances at which particles and their collisions are studied at the Large Hadron Collider are values up to 10 to the power of minus 18. So far, we cannot experimentally reach these limits, but even now, at these scales, the very concept of space-time theoretically loses its meaning. And this is not just mental gymnastics. If we rewind the expansion of the universe, at some point we will find ourselves at a moment when all matter was compressed into a tiny volume with unimaginable temperatures and densities. So there too, the concept of space-time begins to break down. That is, physicists say that it simply did not exist at that moment. It was yet to appear. I repeat, this is not a moment when there was emptiness. This is a moment when there was not even a place where emptiness could exist. Just try to imagine it. We encounter the same thing in theoretical calculations when, crossing the event horizon of a black hole, we find ourselves in a situation of a collapsing universe where time and space behave, to put it mildly, strange modern theories simply cease to work in these extreme conditions. We don't know what happens before the Big Bang or at the very center of a black hole because our concepts of before and after fall apart here and there. Over the past 20, 30 years, physicists have proposed several approaches to solving this problem. One of the most interesting is the principle of holography, and we need to briefly understand it in order to approach the main crazy idea of this issue. Imagine the universe in a jar, or rather, a jar universe, but the interior space of this jar is curved in a special way. Here you are inside, walking in any direction toward the wall. In normal space, you would reach the wall after walking a finite distance. But in this very strange jar, the closer you get to the wall, the slower you move. In fact, it would take you an infinite amount of time to reach the wall, walking at a constant speed. If you direct a beam of light toward the wall, it will reach the wall in a finite amount of time. This is one of the paradoxes of such geometry. The physical distance to the wall is infinite, but light takes a finite amount of time to travel that distance. This strange space with geometry that defies all common intuition is called de Sitter antispace, named after astronomy professor William de Sitter, who even worked closely with Einstein for a time. And if we try to conduct mental, but essentially theoretical, mathematical experiments, we will find that it is possible to construct two completely different theories that describe the same physics. You've probably heard the inside the jar analogy before, but let's rip the label off and get real. One theory says we live inside the jar. That's our universe, stuffed with particles, gravity, and three-dimensional space. Everything happens in here. Planets, black holes, the whole cosmic circus. But then, there's another theory. This one doesn't give a damn about depth or gravity. It's not about what's inside. It's about the walls of the jar. 
a stripped-down, flat version of reality, where particles do their thing without the drama of a third dimension. Now here's the kicker. Physicists claim these two completely different setups are mathematically identical. Every single event happening inside the jar has a perfect mirror event happening on the flat surface. Sound insane? Try this. Imagine a windy lake. On the surface, you see many waves of different sizes, shapes, and intensities. These waves interact with each other in complex ways, and everything is clear until someone tells you that what you see on the surface are not random waves. These waves correspond exactly to the movements of fish swimming in three-dimensional space below the surface. It turns out that each fish at a certain depth creates a wave of a certain size on the surface. The depth of the fish is encoded by the size of the wave, although only the waves on the surface actually exist and they behave as if they describe the movement of objects in three-dimensional space below the surface. This is what physicists are toying with, a universe that acts like a damn hologram, a 2D image that fools us into believing it's 3D. Wild? Absolutely. But don't get too excited, because this idea comes with some serious baggage. Mathematically, the holographic model only works for a universe that's eternal, no beginning, no end, which is cute. Except we know our universe had a beginning. We see it. We measure it. The cosmic past is staring us in the face, and we're desperate to know how this story ends. But here's the twist. All those questions, where we came from, where we're going, are questions about time. And to even start answering them, we need to understand where time itself comes from. That means cracking the code of space-time, not as two separate things, but as one weird unified fabric. And weirdly enough, the Large Hadron Collider might be holding the thread. In that underground monster machine, protons smash into each other at blistering speeds. These are not yet elementary particles, but rather, in essence, little bags containing particles, quarks and gluons. When they collide, we don't see fireworks, we see data. Endless, mind-numbing streams of numbers that physicists have to decode just to figure out what the hell happened. To do that, they use something called Feynman diagrams. Think of them like blueprints for every possible way particles could interact in space-time. Billions of collisions per second, day in, day out. And each interaction has a tangled forest of diagrams to go with it. And guess what? These diagrams work. Their predictions are dead on. The only problem? They're a nightmare. The math is brutal, hundreds of pages of equations just to figure out one tiny particle dance. But then, plot twist, about 30 years ago physicists stumbled onto something shocking. All that complicated math, in some cases it collapses into one simple formula. Clean, elegant, like reality itself was hiding a cheat code. Coincidence or a clue. Nima Arkani Hamed doesn't think it's random. He thinks the real villain here is the idea of virtual particles. In Feynman diagrams, most of the stuff flying around doesn't even exist in the real world. These particles are pure fiction. Ghosts that show up just to do math tricks and vanish before the experiment ends. Only a few, the real ones, actually enter and leave the system. Virtual particles are born and disappear within the process. So what if we only take into account real particles and real physical processes? To do this, we need to break the established picture of the world a little, suggests Arkani Hamid. For example, we need to abandon space-time in the sense familiar to most physicists. Then processes will no longer occur in space-time. They will cease to be local and individually incompatible with the principles of quantum mechanics. So where do we look? Off the beaten math trail, straight into combinatorics, number theory, algebraic geometry, the stuff most physicists barely side-eye in grad school. Arkani Hamed drops a stunner. Take five particles, one, two, three, four, five, let them collide and watch them shuffle seats. That permutation, the simplest toy in combinatorics, maps perfectly onto a scattering event. Draw the swap as lines from start to finish, and suddenly you're staring at a one space, one time diagram of particle carnage. Push the idea harder, plant those particles on a circle, thread each initial label to its final post through a single hub, bam an amplitude diagram. Every piece of that picture is pure math voodoo with zero meaning inside space-time, yet the whole thing spits out the same rock-solid predictions as a jungle of Feynman diagrams. No locality, 
No quantum story, just numbers that work. It's bonkers and that's why we love it. The upshot, space-time might be a cheap holographic knockoff, an emergent mirage floating on top of some deeper, colder mathematical engine we haven't cracked. Picture a balloon, slice it up, and every patch looks meaningless. But stitch the patches back together in exactly the right geometry and poof, you get a balloon. Same deal here. The pieces alone aren't reality. Only the grand assembly is, as many of you have already guessed. This idea is one of many attempts to overcome a fundamental incompatibility between the two most important and successful physical theories of modern physics, the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. These are echoes of the crisis I talked about in one of my recent videos. And besides string theory and other mainstream ideas, there are lesser known ones that are particularly interesting because they are also based on existing physics and mathematics, but through different approaches and a different perspective on them. Knowledge isn't free to make, but it's one click to keep alive. Join our crew of curiosity junkies. Subscribe, share this video with a fellow science nerd, and let YouTube know smart content still matters.